fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And now we have the uh, ship. Shipwreck hunter Ross Richardson, and uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, talk with us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, yeah, I've been looking forward to this one. I do a lot of true crime, a lot of paranormal, and uh, this one's kind of exciting because it's a little bit different, you know, uh, um, shipwrecks and searching for that, and and uh, it's, it seems like a, it's a nice angle. I, I can relate to this, so uh, very interested. Um, where did you kind of start, like? Uh, how did you get into searching for um, ships? Well, you know, I, I've been fascinated with shipwrecks, even as a little kid. You know, I would build model ships of the Titanic or World War II boats and then sink them in our swimming pool, you know, and then put a mask on. I'm talking six years old, seven years old, put a little mask on and dive down and look at them on the bottom of the pool. So I started out young. I, I can't really put a finger on the fascination uh, there's really no maritime or nautical background for my family. I just was really into the Titanic story, disasters, things like that, and it really fascinated me. And I actually put it on a back shelf uh, when I got a little bit older and, you know, started a family, working and all those things. And uh, my son was at basketball practice at downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I walked across the street into the library the public library, and kind of went through the Michigan history section, and it was about the time the movie Titanic came out, so it's about 97. So then I found some uh, books on Great Lake shipwrecks, and I started looking, and I started noticing, man, there's all these ships, and they're still missing out there. And I said, that can't be. How can these big ships be sitting out there in a lake and not be found? So that kind of started me down the path of, getting involved with looking for these shipwrecks, finding them, and then documenting them. And I've been uh, really lucky that I hit it at just the right time that the technology became available for us to be able to start finding these huge shipwrecks that have just been sitting out there for 100, in some cases, 150 years. Hmm. Is that the main reason, then? Is it just it's really about technology or uh, when the ship sinks and they just don't bother finding it? Uh, you know, a lot of it is, is the technology, and to be able to get down to the depths we can get down to now, whether it be through divers or remotely. Um, the thing that really attracts me is, you know, everybody loves a good mystery, and these are great mysteries out there that are solvable. And that's kind of started me down a path of looking at some other things, missing aircraft, missing persons, maybe using some of these techniques we use in shipwreck hunting, some of the problem-solving and applying them towards cases that maybe haven't been looked at in quite a while. Yeah, yeah, you know, and with the you know recent planes that have gone missing. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. You know, I mean, you have to wonder. I think people were surprised with MH370 uh, because uh, you know a big, huge jet it goes missing, and you know. Uh, Time goes by and they can't find it, and they didn't know where it went. You know, it seems like I think more people are surprised that how can that be? Well, and, and I think what really drives a good mystery, and it drives, it's the same thing that drives the fascination of the D.B. Cooper mystery, is we don't know where, but not only that, we don't know what. We don't know where that plane is, but we don't know how it got there. We don't know what happened to put it in that location. We don't even know. So you have the double intrigue. If we knew one part of that puzzle, that, is, that mystery wouldn't be as interesting. But when you have two mysteries like that within one mystery, that's what makes it really fascinating, like, like the D.B. Cooper. Right. We don't know what happened to him, and we don't know who he is. That's two mysteries right there, and that's what really intrigues people. 
Yeah, yeah, and that that was an unusual case. Um, uh, so, th- and that happened back in 1971. And, yes, uh, the world's only unsolved skyjacking. So which is pretty amazing when you think about it. What, so uh, maybe run over the details. You know, for me, 1971 wasn't that long ago, <laughs> but I'm kind of aware. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm I'm forever surprised as I go through and doing shows. A lot of people. Um, that are listening were born, you know, in the 80s and 90s, and uh, cases like this is is really old for them. So um, it's, it's just, you know, but run through some of the scenario of that. I'm um, sure, sure. Well, well, it started in Portland on Thanksgiving Eve in 1971 when a man approached the uh, ticket booth for Northwest Airlines and bought a ticket to Seattle, and he gave his name as Dan Cooper. And there was nothing that really stood out about this man. He was in a business suit. He carried a briefcase, um, and, and he smoked. So he, he got on the plane. Oh, and I was going to say, plane, sorry, I was going to say, and, and back then you didn't have to show ID and go through all the security you go through now. Just, you didn't have to do any. It's amazing how loose the restrictions were then. Yeah. Uh, skyjackers back in the day carried onto the plane, they carried grenades, handguns, one man carried a shotgun on the plane, yeah. another one carried a parachute onto the plane. I mean, it's yeah. it was a wild west. Yeah, that's, really why, that's why I wanted to mention, because, you know, I, I think, like I said, people now, younger people would not have a clue about this. I mean, they've always known the security. And and you could smoke anywhere back then, too. Oh, yes. You know. Yes. Uh, you could sm- Smoking was very prevalent. And, and I tell people... You know, we don't. We have all the no smoking in restaurants uh, here. There's no smoking in our house. I've never even taken a puff off a cigarette. Yeah, yeah. But I had two older brothers, and I can remember being in our four door car, and my parents would both light up, yeah. and then my older brothers who were teenagers, they would keep it low, and they would light up too. Yeah. And I would sit in that car with all four of them smoking. Yeah. And that was a common occurrence on trips and yeah. stuff. It, it's like it was such a different. Amazing. Yeah, it was so different then. You know. Compared to now, a different time. Yeah. So anyway, I, you know, go ahead. I was. I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. Well, the plane took off heading towards Seattle, and I, it's a pretty short flight, less than an hour. And as soon as it took off, this uh, Dan Cooper handed a note to one of the stewardesses, and you know, motioned for her to look at it, and said, "You know, Miss, I have a bomb. Come sit with me." So she did. And he explained to her his demands. He sent a note up to the cockpit, but he demanded the note back. And he asked for a few items. He asked for when the plane landed in Seattle for it to be refueled. He asked for four parachutes in total. So it would be two back chutes or two uh, main primary chutes, as we call them. But he referred to them as back chutes, I believe, and uh, two front chutes, which would be the reserves, and $200,000. And, and non-negotiable currency, or, or a uh, negotiable American currency. It was a strange term that he used. Mm. I kind of gave a hint maybe he spent some time abroad in, in a different place. So he wanted $200,000 in cash, basically, in unmarked bills. And so they circled Seattle for a while, an hour or two, while the FBI collected these things. They collected the money, they collected the parachutes, And when they had these things ready, they landed the plane and brought them to the plane, and they refueled at the same time. But when he got the the money, well, when they landed, he let the uh, hostages go, and the money and the parachutes were brought on on board. And he checked them out and said, okay, he let everybody go. So they just had the flight crew and the stewardess on board. Everybody got to let the other two stewardesses go. And he said, fly the plane to Mexico. Well, the pilots knew that the configuration he asked for, which was wheels down, flap set at 15 degrees, I believe, and the back door open, they said, you know, we're not going to make it that far. We need to stop and refuel. So they agreed to refuel at Reno. He also wanted the rear stairs on this. And, and this is a 727 aircraft, if people don't know. And it had the unusual feature of an aft staircase or rear stairs that lowered like a ramp. And you see it on a lot of cargo planes now where this big ramp comes down. Well, here a little staircase would lower, 
And that was designed that way so the 727 could be used in smaller airports. So they didn't have the new fancy terminals with the big arms that come out and hook onto the side of the plane. So he knew this plane had this feature, and it would be a, a much safer way to exit an aircraft than it would an aircraft with only side doors, because, you know, you could get hit with a, with a tail section. If you had engines back there, you might get sucked into one of the engines. Uh, pretty dangerous stuff. Hmm. And so this was Thanksgiving night as well, wasn't it? Yes, the evil Thanksgiving, the busiest bar night of the year, yeah. they say. Yeah. And, you know, right before a long holiday weekend. Yeah. Uh, the weather was rainy. It was kind of dark, a little chilly outside, so it wasn't great weather. Um, but, but that's really good timing because I, I'd imagine uh, the airports would have been busy and people would have been all over the place and... You know, it's it's uh, it's a busy time. Yes, yes, it would have been busy, and law enforcement, you know, probably would have been looking forward to uh, a Thanksgiving dinner at home with their families. So there's another aspect of it. Um, yeah, it is, it is interesting timing. And maybe before the weather turns worse, and you get into snowfall and the higher altitudes and things like that, too, because there's really uh, not a good indication of where he was deciding to jump out. And that ca that's kind of the next part of the story. Right. As the plane took off about uh, right around 8 o'clock at night, it took off and headed south. And after a, little while, after a little while in flight, the rear stairs were lowered, and the Stan Cooper character jumped into the night. And that's it. That's the last anybody has ever seen of Dan Cooper. So why, why was that so um, hard? In, you know, because if the plane is um, flying, I guess it was flying toward Mexico or something. But did they not know where he jumped out? Like uh, the pilots and the and the and the one steward. That's that's a big debate right now. And I kind of know some of the people who investigate the case, and there's a website out there, the D.D. Cooper Forum. If you get a chance to stop by the website, uh, that's really where a lot of the discussions are carrying on online about uh, the money find, which we'll talk about in a little bit, right. and, and the course of the aircraft. And the truth is they really didn't know where the aircraft was when he jumped. Um, just some uh, information that was recently re released through a Freedom of Information Act from, I believe, the Portland or the uh, Reno, Nevada FBI office as they were interviewing one of the pilots. Uh, his name was Anderson. And he said uh, when, when he jumped that they had not reached Portland proper but were definitely in the suburbs or immediate vicinity thereof. Well, that puts him very near Portland and not further north where originally it was thought he jumped up by uh, right. Lake Merwin, or up in that area, right. uh, up in the battleground area. So uh, Anderson added, this comes right from the uh, FBI's interview of him a couple days later, he said Anderson added, it had not occurred to them at the time to pinpoint their exact location at the time of the oscillation, which is what they recorded when, when the person jumped. So... You know, if you think about it, these pilots had a lot of things on their mind. They were, they were flying their aircraft in an unusual configuration. They had a man in back who claimed to have a bomb. So, I mean, that's got to be in the back of your mind all the time. Is what if that thing goes off? Right. You know, what damage is that going to do to the aircraft? So these pilots were very busy. The weather was not good. They were flying at 10,000 feet. Uh, it, yeah, it was not very good conditions, and they had a lot more things on their mind. So they really didn't do a good job of pinpointing where the plane was when he jumped. And that's a, there's a lot of conjecture right now as to where the flight path was and how far along the flight path did Dan Cooper jump out of the back of 727. Yeah, you know, and I'm not thinking so much, I mean, the, the pilots, and I'm uh, for sure, because not only that, uh, you know, I've talked to people in, in with other different hijacking situations. And, and, yeah, there's training and stuff, but when, when you – they would have never been expecting this sort of thing. You don't expect to be hijacked, and when it happens, you don't know always how you're going to react and how stress comes in, and are they going to follow every exact rule because, 
you know, people are people. But I was thinking more about um, don't they track the plane flights as they're flying from the airports and, and radar and stuff? They do, and, and I don't know if, some, if that information is available or if that information, let me put it this way, if that information exists and the FBI isn't sharing it because the FBI is not sharing a lot of information about this case. So that's another interesting aspect of it is the FBI might have some pertinent information about the flight path, but they're not releasing it publicly. Well, why would that so be? It, there, why would the FBI be so, I mean, protective, especially now that it's, you know, almost 50 years? Yeah, it is. It is. And that they consider it an ongoing investigation. Even though they're not actively investigating, they're really more, it's more of a passive investigation. You know, the cases are closed but they're not going out or expending anything and in, in investigating anything further. So I, I think they're just hoping things kind of quiet down and go away. You know, there's been uh, over the past five or ten years quite, uh, quite an interesting amount of people who have come forth with suspects, and we'll probably talk about a few of those. In some cases, the FBI has been, you know, brought and made to, made to not look very good. They've been presented in a not but not a very good light. So I think they're probably done dealing with the um, PR nightmare that yeah. this case has created for them. Yeah, yeah. And, and and so anyway, so he jumped out of the plane. And, uh, and that was it. That was and, it. And there, was, there were a couple of chase planes following, but they really couldn't make visual contact. I mean, the conditions weren't there. And it would be really tough to see at night somebody exiting an aircraft like that. And nothing showed up on radar that we know of. They don't know exactly where everything happened. So really, he just disappeared into the night. And that was it. Uh, when the plane landed in Reno, there were a few clues left behind, some cigarette butts and some glasses he may have touched. They even removed the seat he sat in from the aircraft. So there were some items taken from there. He left behind a couple of parachutes, and one was uh, pulled, and the parachute was pulled out, and he used some of the cords, some of the parachute cords, to tie up the money bag. And the money bag, he asked for a knapsack. He wanted a backpack-type thing. Well, the FBI gave him just basically a canvas bag with no attachment points whatsoever. And they gave the money to him in $20 bills. And these bills were all recorded. The serial numbers were all recorded. And it was a decent-sized package. It weighed about 22 pounds with no way. So he took the parachute cords and tried to create a harness around this bag to hook to his body or hook, hook on him somehow. There's some debate. Some people said, you know, he tied it in a way it would hang below him. Some people said, you know, he tied it closer to his stomach, you know, or closer to the reserve chute. And we really don't know how he tied it. But the interesting thing is a decent amount of this ransom showed up nine years later in the bank of the Columbia River at a place called Tina Bar. So it was discovered in 1980 by a young man who was digging a pit for his family's campfire not too far from the uh, water's edge. And there he found some rotted bills. It turned out to be about $5,800 of the ransom money, an original order. And there's some reports that there were a lot of shards, a lot of smaller pieces of bills throughout that area that the FBI recovered. So it's uh, quite possible that there was a lot more ransom money there. It was just either decayed or chewed up by something and spread out over a bigger area. Hmm. That's interesting. And, and so did they, uh, I was going to say the other thing back there, the elevation of where he dropped from, was it, like how high was that? His, the, the aircraft was at 10,000 feet. So, wow. you know, just less than a couple miles high. Wow. Is, is that, is, oh. and was that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I never researched that part. Is that kind of, too high to do a parachute jump from back back in 1971? Oh, no, not at all. 
um, actually, it was very smart. He ordered them to fly the plane at 10,000 feet so they didn't have to pressurize the uh, cabin. So he could jump out and not have to, you know, when he opened the door, he didn't have to worry about being sucked out by the pressure. So people can survive at 10,000 feet without having additional oxygen. So I thought that was a, a pretty smart thing he did. So he had, so he, that, yeah, yeah, he planned this. Yeah, it looked like he had some planning. Um, there's a big debate on how much knowledge Dan Cooper had about aircraft and aeronautics and skydiving and things, because there's some things you think, well, this guy was pretty sharp, you know. He knew a lot of things. He he knew what was going on. He totally planned this out. And then you look at some of the items, and you think, well, this guy was a complete amateur. Nobody would have jumped in conditions like that, you know. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, he didn't have Google. <laughs> you know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so the, the FBI believes he had just enough information to get himself into trouble. And that's kind of their stance. They don't think he was an experienced parachutist. He maybe had some knowledge, an experienced skydiver. He had some knowledge, but just enough to get him into trouble. Yeah. Uh, would, would you, would you think there's a reason for, for him asking for four? Parachutes? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's it's really kind of genius because that that gives the implication that he's taking somebody with him, you know, a hostage with him. Well, that's going to uh, throw the FBI off from trying to sabotage the shoots because that would be a PR nightmare to have somebody uh, jump and die when you know sabotage shoot by the FBI. So that pretty much ensured that they weren't going to do anything funny with those shoots. Yeah, yeah. At least that, that's what I think his thought was. And, and interesting, they brought him two main shoots and two reserve shoots. So the primaries, there were two different kinds. There was a military version, which was kind of crude, kind of something you would use in World War II. And then there was a newer version, uh, Sky Commander, I believe. I have to think about that. But it was a newer, more steerable, a sport shoot that would have been much more desirable to anybody with any skydiving experience. So there's some argument about his shoot selection, whether that proved he had some expertise or whether that proved he was basically an amateur. Some people would argue, oh, he used the military shoot because it was more sturdy. And if you released it slowly out the back of the stairs, then the wind would catch it and it would have pulled him out gently, and he wouldn't have torn the shoe. Or if he would have jumped out at 200 miles an hour with a, with a paracommander, it wasn't as durable as a military shoe. So he was an expert. Other people would say, man, if you're jumping at night, you want a shoot that you can steer. The paracommander is one you can steer. The military shoot he used was unsteerable, really. It was really quite a crude shoot. And jumping in such a wooded area, you know, would be extremely dangerous. And no experienced skydiver would look at that and do a blind jump at night in those weather conditions. With the clothing he was wearing and the equipment he requested, uh, nobody with any experience would go through with that, even for, for $200,000. Yeah. So then uh, what, where did the FBI go? Like, who were their main suspects? Well, they, they looked at over a 1,000 people to begin with, and quite a few interesting characters. I think one was a descendant of Abraham Lincoln. Another one was a John List. He murdered his entire family and was on the run. So they looked at a lot of people, but really none of them panned out, and they dismissed most of them. There were a few probably they couldn't dismiss, and but they won't say who those suspects are. And then over the years, much like much like the person I brought forth as a possibility, uh, people have brought forth relatives, friends, and brought forth ideas of different suspects, uh, quite a few of them, really. And if you look at each of these suspects individually, they're each plausible. I mean, some are experienced parachutists, veterans. Uh, they kind of look like some of the, the two pictures the FBI had, the two sketches, which is really the benchmark people look at. 
you know, three stewardesses on board sat with an FBI sketch artist and created a composite sketch. So the FBI sketch artist laid a book before them with ten different eye types, and, okay, they would pick this one. Ten different noses, the stewards would pick this one, and they, they kind of reached a consensus, and they came out with this black and white sketch, which would which they call basically uh, FBI Sketch A. Or the Bing Crosby sketch, because it looks kind of like Bing Crosby. It's just a normal-looking guy, pretty average-looking. No, Nothing stands out about him. Well, a few of the eyewitnesses, they talked to the passengers who saw him. They said, well, we remember him a little differently. And they did a couple changes. They made him look a little more menacing. They added some color to his face because people said he was swarthy or olive-complected or very tan. And they came out with composite sketch B, which is a little bit different looking. If you held them up side by side, they, there's enough difference that you could say, oh, maybe they're even different people. So the argument is, well, it looks like either one of these or maybe neither of these people, but there's really nothing outstanding about the way he looks if you were to look at them. Hmm. So were they? So now who you um, have brought forward, was that person... Um a suspect on their list? Not they haven't said, but I don't think so. I mean, he's so obscure. The story's so obscure that I really had to dig around and find out about it, and there's just really no official information about this person. And and the suspects fall into two categories. They fall into the category of either he survived the jump or did not survive the jump. Now, the FBI believes the Cooper suspect, Dan Cooper, did not survive the jump. They believe he died. They just have not been able to figure out where or how or any of the details, but they looked at the conditions, talked to experts, looked at the equipment he was wearing, the clothing he was wearing. They looked at the jump, and they said, and in his level of experience that he uh, demonstrated and said, you know what, we don't think this person survived the jump. Now... Almost every suspect brought forth before is somebody who was alive or seen after Thanksgiving, 1971. Now, Robert Richard Lepsey from Grayling, Michigan, the, the man uh, I presented as a possible suspect, he hasn't been seen since that date. And one interesting thing of all the people in his life I've interviewed, family members, and coworkers, they said, you know, we thought we would have seen him again. You know, something must have happened to him that he didn't come back. He might have had a little wild streak and disappeared for a while, but something happened to him. So I find that very interesting. And really, there's only one other suspect out there that's been presented that it, that falls in that missing person category, and that is Melvin Wilson. And he has another he has another great story, but he has blue eyes, which doesn't match the FBI's description of brown eyes. And I don't think he looks too much like the uh, the sketches. So, wow. though you really have two two people, two missing persons versus you know really a couple dozen relevant suspects who were all seen alive after the jump. And and um, so uh, on your suspect, how how did you um, find him? Like, what brought you to that person? Well, it's, it's, it's a roundabout story. So we talked before about shipwreck diving so, and, and shipwreck hunting. So part of shipwreck hunting is you find a shipwreck, well, then you go down and you dive. And some of these wrecks are deep, so we get into what's called technical diving or decompression diving, diving where you can't go right to the surface. You have something either above you, either an overhead environment, like you're inside a shipwreck, or a decompression obligation. So it's a higher level of training. So I got to be a pretty good diver. So one of the things I wanted to do is I, I do a lot of volunteering around the community, and I volunteered for our sheriff's dive team. And we do things, we recover evidence that has been thrown in water, like a handgun in a robbery or something like that. Another unfortunate job we have to do is recover bodies. So we go through training with other sheriff's departments and things like this and learn how to dive underneath ice, you know, how to retrieve bodies, things like this. 
Well, I started hearing from some of the other sheriff's departments about bodies missing in lakes in northern Michigan. Now, I'd already looked for a lot of shipwrecks, and I've looked for missing aircraft also. But I thought, man, this is strange that there's these bodies. You look, you, you see a lake before you, and somewhere in that lake on the bottom is, you know, somebody's loved one. So I, I decided to create a website called Michigan Mysteries to document some of these missing drowning victims, as long as, as well as shipwrecks and missing aircraft and, and missing person cases I found interesting. So I had written a book about a shipwreck discovery in maritime history, and I was working on, on my next book, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do a little differently. I'm going to tell things that are missing in the Michigan area but are findable, that if people use some of the detective work we use in shipwreck hunting and finding missing aircraft, you know, if we apply those to missing persons or drowning victims, we may be able to recover these. And a lot of these things are people don't know things are missing, so they don't know to look for them. So they end up watching shows like CSI, things like that, for their mysteries, when actually, right in their backyard, there could be something they could solve themselves. So that was kind of my idea behind it. Well, one of the missing persons I researched was Robert Richard Lebsey, this grocery store manager who just went out for lunch one day from his grocery store and disappeared, and they found his car a few days later in an airport parking lot. And I thought, man, there's got to be a story behind this you know, was he murdered? Did he run off? You know, how come nobody knows anything about this guy? So that's how I started researching Robert Richard Bubsy. And 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 what did you find? So was was there a reason? Like, I mean, you don't go out for lunch and then go to the airport. I mean, <laughs> no, no. Um, I I had been working on it for a while and, and talking with his daughter Lisa Lebsy. And she was only about 10 or 11 when he disappeared. And she really loved him. And so did his wife. And he was a married father of four. And a good guy, by all accounts. A loving father, spent time with his kids and everything. So it's kind of out of character. He kind of like a really average neighbor, just kind of disappearing and never be seen again. You know, it really makes you wonder what the heck happened. So... I researched him, but in talking with coworkers later on, I found out that he was suspected in taking money from the safe and jamming the safe shut at his grocery store. And when the authorities went and investigated, they went to the way they knew his car was found at the airport. They went there and they talked to the ticket agents and they said, yeah, man fitting his description bought tickets with a final destination of Mexico. So, he disappeared and was never heard from again, never seen again, nothing. Just after that day, he, for all intents and purposes, disappeared. Wow. Wow. And so what, what led you to think that he might be the suspect for the um, D.B. Cooper? Well, in, in writing the book, the orig my original idea was to have 10 missing ships, 10 shipwrecks, 10 missing aircraft, 10 persons. But I really got intrigued by this. The airport where his car was found is not very far from my house. So it's a short drive from me. Just something spoke to me. I, sometimes, I don't know if it's intuition, I don't know, sometimes something speaks to you. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something spoke to me about this and just said, hey, there's something more about this guy. So... I went to the library to pull the microfilm from the time he disappeared and seeing if there were any accidents, any uh, bodies found that were not identified, things like that. Whatever I could find, weather, I looked at the weather, every, and I really found nothing in those newspapers except for on the front of every newspaper there were stories of skyjackings. Every day, there was either a new uh, airplane hijacking to Cuba or a, a case going on about it. So, I mean, it was every front page. And a light bulb went in my head, and I said, well, this car was found at an airport. And I remember the D.D. Cooper story from In Search Of, you know, watching the Leonard Demoy show as a kid. Right. I said, yeah, D.D. Cooper. And, he's, and he had been uh, mentioned, and uh, D.D. Cooper had been mentioned in pop culture references. There was a movie out uh, without a paddle. 
you know, Kid Rock, he's mentioned in one of Kid Rocks. So, so, I mean, you know, he's still relevant these days. There's still stories out about him. So I thought, you know, that would be interesting to loosely compare the two because, to be quite honest, I'm not going to have a lot of information about Robert Richard Letts because he disappeared, you know, over 40 years ago. Yeah. And back then there just wasn't that much information available. It wasn't like today where, you know, you could look at a Facebook account and really reconstruct somebody's life. Yeah. There just wasn't anything there. So I thought, you know, it would be neat to loosely compare the two. And actually, I shelved the project for six months after I wrote that down. And, uh, you know, and, and to be honest, I, I shelved the project because I got depressed. Because when you're dealing with families with missing loved ones, and you're talking, and they're crying, and I'm a, kind of an empathetic guy. And, man, I just started feeling really ter- terrible about it. So <laughs> yeah. I shelved the project and, and other things, and I just was depressed. So pulled it out that summer and started looking at it. I said, okay, this is interesting. Well, let's loosely compare. And then I started looking at what they knew about uh, Cooper's suspect, Dan Cooper. And he was the same height, same weight, same eye color, same hair color. You know, they said he had no discernible accent and was a very gentle, was a, was a nice person to the, you know, the flight crew, the stewardesses, uh, said he was a gentleman. And I started comparing, I said, man, there are some resemblance in some of the pictures of Robert Richard Lepsey and the D.B. Cooper sketches. They, some of them have some similarities there. They're both pretty ordinary looking men. And I thought, wow. I'm going to write a book and throw this out there and see what happens. And that's exactly what I did. And what's happened? <laughs> well, the story, really about Thanksgiving, the story took off big. And I, I think it's interesting because uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, our media is changing so fast that, you know, things go viral very quickly and then fade very quickly, but also because so many people have brought forth Cooper suspects, it's like, oh, okay, there's another one, and then that's it. Yeah. So really things have been quiet on the case, but I just wanted to get it out there that here's a guy who's a missing person who fits what the FBI is looking for physically and some of the other things we know about him, and really there's no silver bullet to say it's not. Like if he had blue eyes, I would say, okay probably not him. If there were something about him that was really off from the description, such as height or or uh, the amount of hair he has, I'd say, oh, okay, that's probably not him, but there's nothing out there to say that it's not him. And, you know, if you look at how much the D.B. Cooper case has been uh, investigated by the FBI and by uh, individuals who just get interested in a good mystery, you would think it would be solved by now unless it was some really obscure person in some obscure circumstances that would lead it not to be solved. You said that he had bought uh, uh, tickets to Mexico. Were they ever used? Yes. Yes, he, uh, he, he went to a bigger airport is my assumption. And then, you know, took a connector flight and worked his way out west from that airport. So he probably flew to Detroit or Chicago. Uh, and Robert Richard Lepsey was raised in Chicago. And I tried to get information from the Grayling Police Department. Grayling is a small town he, he is from, and the Michigan State Police. But all their records have been purged from that time. And he was never considered a missing person by either department because they thought he fled voluntarily and he was suspected of of embezzling money. So all those records, you know, from from 1969, they didn't really keep around. So those are all gone. So there's no records, there's no airport records, there's nothing. It's just, you know, interviews of people uh, from that time who were involved in the case. Hmm. Wow. And so, what's the reaction of the family? Um, is is his wife, his wife from that time, still alive, and 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 daughter? No, she passed away in two thousand and twelve. Uh, the daughter's reaction is, yeah, those FBI sketches kind of look like my dad, but that's about it. She doesn't know. So, 
the, the rest of the family doesn't think there's a resemblance. I don't know if you've seen the, the sketches and the pictures. They, the, the rest of the family doesn't feel it could be him. And uh, or I should say other family members. I'm, uh, I'm in touch with his, his sister. and We have uh, exchanges once in a while about it. So they really don't feel that there's much of a resemblance there. Um, sometimes I do. Sometimes I look and I say, yeah, these are kind of close. You know, if you were a 22-year-old stewardess and you were doing, you know, picking out things out of a book and put together a composite, I can see some of the chin, the, you know, the eyes, some of the facial features are are pretty close to this guy. So it isn't, yeah, this yeah, is definitely right. a little bit different. Most suspects usually have a, have a big family suspect promoter who says, I'm 100% sure this is my uncle. This is this was my husband. This is, you know, where there's this is not the case with this with this gentleman. Wow. Well, you know, and it's it's really hard to um, uh, rely totally on the uh, witness testimony as well. It's not always. I mean, they give you the best they can, but um, sometimes it's a little flawed. Yeah, yeah, and it's and you know these were stewardesses. They were twenty two and 23 years old and you know they described the person as in their mid 40s other people described him as in his 30s one person even described him as being 60 years old so there's this huge range of description but I have an older daughter and when she was about 22 she was telling me the story about this guy at the bar who tried to buy her a drink and she said yeah this old creepy guy tried to buy me a drink i said well how old was he and she said 27 <laughs> <laughs> you know to a 22 year old yeah. that seems like an old guy so yeah, i mean it's, yeah. it's really when you look through for for more experience more gentle for with gentlemen with more life experience like you and i yeah. you know yeah. you look at somebody in their 30s and 40s okay that's kind of a, a broad range but to a, a younger stewardess like that at 22 23 years old you know everybody looks like an old guy so yeah. it's really hard to, to pinpoint those things but they did spend five hours with him so and they knew he was special and they even brought notes up to the or, or gave notes to the pilots about his about the way he looked so they had a chance to memorize his face and look at some of those facial features. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty interesting. Have you have you got much reaction on it now? Oh, the story went viral. It's been seen by millions of people. So WZZM out of Grand Rapids did a really nice piece. I thought it was very well done, and it can be seen on their website at wzzmtv.com. If you do a search there, or if you just search. D.B. Cooper, Lepsey, or Robert Richard Lepsey, D.B. Cooper, that's probably one of the first things that will come up. And that has seen millions of hits. I haven't heard probably tens of millions of hits by now of uh, people looking at it. And, and I also have uh, on my website, michiganmysteries.com, if people want to go there, I have some comparisons of the FBI sketch with uh, photos of Robert Richard Lepsey. And they can do a side by side comparison. Yeah, of course. And and your book's called Still Missing. It's Rethinking D.B. Cooper and Other Mysteries. Um, yes. Pretty good. So, what, what, so you covered other mysteries in the book? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, well, I, I, I covered one of each, really. It's a missing person, a missing aircraft, and a missing ship. And the missing aircraft is a Cessna that disappeared in 1977 the 4th of July, and I was flying over the middle of the state and never land, they never landed at the airport it was supposed to, and they've never found any wreckage or anything. And it's a friend of mine's parents were in the aircraft. So it's a, it's a gentleman uh, I met years back, and I wanted to include the story of his parents in there and, and what he's gone through since 1977 trying to find that aircraft, which is... It's it's a complete mystery. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, How does the, that happen? The lower, I, water usually hides a lot of things. It usually hides vehicles. It usually hides aircraft. 
and I hide shipwrecks, right? So that's kind of my specialty is looking in water. But there was really no water in the flight path, and it was it was a hot Fourth of July day. So every lake would have had somebody on it, I and mean, there's a lot of lakes in the Lower Peninsula of Michigan, but they're all crowded with tourists and fisher fisher people and people swimming. So it isn't like there would be a large body of water where this plane could have went down and nobody would have seen it. And it is it, it's a mystery. That's why I, I, I like the story so much is because where the heck did this thing go? And there are some remote areas in the Lower Peninsula, and it was flying over some pretty remote areas, but you think by now a hunter or a fisherman or a hiker or a surveyor would have stumbled across the crash site and reported it to the authorities because the uh, NTSB or the FAA really does a good job of recovering all the aircraft pieces when an aircraft goes down. So when you find a part of an aircraft, you know it's not supposed to be there. and Just, you know, people should report that immediately. But no wreckage has ever been found, nothing. It's just, uh, it's like they just vanished and it disappeared in midair. Wow. And, and did you sort of, uh, so you knew two of the people on the, on the plane. Did you sort of follow up to see if maybe someone was was intentionally killed, maybe, um, or the plane was taken, or? That's one of the theories that uh, his his uh, their son John, my friend John Block, and he's a retired sheriff's department detective, so he's a pretty sharp guy, and he's dealt with a lot of things. And he said they had to look at that and say, okay. Did my dad commit suicide? You know, was it, uh, did he take my mom out and commit suicide? Did they land at the airfield and witness something they weren't supposed to? Were they, were they killed and their aircraft taken, you know, and used for parts? But none of the parts and serial numbers have ever appeared anywhere that has been verified. So, those are possibilities. I mean, you can't say 100% sure that those didn't happen. Hmm. But it's just, it's just a great mystery because, yeah, what the heck did happen? I mean, that could be, but that's pretty rare that, you know, a couple would be killed. And to move a couple of bodies takes a lot of effort. That's one thing. If you look at missing persons and kidnapping cases, it's usually smaller women, you know, 100, 120 pounds. Uh, I'm a pretty big guy. And it would take at least four adult men to move my body if something happened, right? So I'm not portable. Most men aren't. That's why most missing persons you, you will find will be women, children, smaller, that their bodies are portable, that they can get rid of them. So to get rid of two adults would be pretty tough if you were to kill them. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Sounds pretty interesting. And then you covered a uh, missing ship. So that one, did you take some diving in there or? Uh, this one is still missing, and it was uh, a ship named the Andaste, which disappeared in 1929, right before the crash of the stock market. And it was a freighter leaving a town called Grand Haven, Michigan. And it was carrying a load of gravel heading to Chicago. And not a lot of people know this, but Soldier Field, the area by the Field Museum in Chicago, all that is filled in with gravel. From Michigan, they used to take these craters and run it over there, and they filled all that area in and reclaimed it from Lake Michigan. And the ship was heading there with a load of gravel and got hit by a storm and vanished, and nothing nothing was known. I mean, it's an ugly boat, but nothing was known about this for five days until a fish tug was out about 10 miles offshore and came across a wreckage field, all types of floating debris and everything from the shipwreck. And the next day, bodies started washing up along the shoreline of where the ship departed. And this was about six days after it had disappeared. And they washed up all along the shorelines, and there's all the newspaper accounts. So, you know, so-and-so came home today. So-and-so, you know, washed up at this point. And about half the crew washed up, and about half of them had life jackets on. So somewhere out there in that lake is this big 265-foot freighter. And quietly, it's become one of the most uh, looked-after shipwrecks lately. And I think it'll be really neat 
when it's found. I have an interest in it because I grew up near Grand Haven. I spent a lot of time as a youth on the beaches of Grand Haven, and I just had no idea that so many ships were right off, you know, that port. Yeah. Wow. You've had an interesting life. Um, <laughs> you, you, you did um, the Westmoreland as well, and you've written a book about that. Um, oh, yes. That's probably my, my favorite shipwreck and a fun, and a fun story. Uh, because it was supposed to be carrying $10,000 in gold coins and 280 barrels of whiskey. So that would have been a, a nice find had I found the safe to that ship. Believe me, I looked. <laughs> but uh, it sank in 1854, so it was a pre-Civil War steamer, which is pretty rare, and a passenger ship, but in just beautiful condition at the bottom of Lake Michigan. Probably one of the best preserved shipwrecks from the 1850s on the planet. Wow, and so and so you never found it, the gold. <laughs> no, not from a lack of looking, and uh, unfortunately, one of my dive buddies uh, was severely injured on our last dive, his last dive ever uh, on the boat. So I, I haven't uh, dived it as much these last couple years. Well, we spent a lot of time down there looking, going inside, trying to find uh, a safe full of gold. We think we know where the whiskey is, but it's on the lower level of the ship in silt. Um, someday, maybe we'll get uh, an agreement with a state and a, and a local museum and be able to retrieve some of the artifacts to display them. But right now, it's illegal to yeah, what is, what, uh, take any of the artifacts. So, yeah, what is, what is the legal stance on something like that when you find a ship that's sunk, you know, years well, the ago? State, the state considers the bottom lands of Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, any of the Great Lakes, they consider them like a state park, I guess would be, or state lands, I guess. So they consider that state land, so they say anything on state land, the state owns. Now, that, they can be defeated in court, but it's very expensive. And, you know, that's not what I'm about. I love the history. I love the mystery. Artifacts and things like that really aren't my thing. I try to stay away from that because it can be a mess and it can make your life a nightmare right. getting involved. But the state says they own it, which is fine because back in the day, maybe 20, 30 years ago, when a shipwreck was found, all the divers would come and steal everything off it, all the pottery, glasses, dishes, uh, implements, any type of you know compasses everything they would strip these wrecks right down of all the artifacts well you know then nobody else can see them but i think now we're starting to open up and say okay some historical societies and things like that if they can recover and preserve them it would be nice for people who aren't divers to be able to see some of these artifacts other than have them just rot away and disappear on the bottom of the great lakes yeah that's um unfortunate you you know that that would be kind of a a good thing, you know, bring them up and uh, and they're not interested in, in recovering any of that. Or I think I think the state is so busy with everything that's going on, and it's such a vast amount of shipwrecks that are down there. Um, the, the national government has set up and has stepped up and set up a couple of NOAA preserves, one in Alpena, Michigan, and a new one they're going to open in Milwaukee. And I think that helps preserve some of it, but there's such a huge amount. And, and what's unusual about Great Lakes wrecks is that they're from the 1800s. So can you imagine walking downtown and finding a building sealed up since 1872 and opening up and walk inside and, wow, all the, everything is the same from 1872? That's what these shipwrecks are. They're in great shape when you get inside. Things are amazingly preserved. There's uh, tools and implements and things of everyday life right yeah. there from that time period, and it's just an unusual thing. But, you know, and the question is, what do we do with these items? Yeah, that would be amazing to see. You know, it's like a frozen in time from, from a long time it, ago. Yeah, It is. We, we call them uh, underwater museums. And I think the great thing is if you go on YouTube, you can look up. I've got some videos there, but other divers and explorers put their videos up so you can actually feel what it's like to dive these wrecks because the visibility is 
amazing. You can have 50 to 100 feet of visibility in the Great Lakes now because of the quagga mussels. So you have this amazing visibility, and you can go inside these shipwrecks. We call them uh, underwater haunted houses because they're really creepy. So you can go in there and really go into a place that's just like a museum. You know, but the nice thing is we can now share that with people who aren't divers, who might not, you know, be interested or might not be able to. Maybe they're older or have a physical disability or just don't want to go through all that training to actually get down there and see it. We can share that with people and show them just what it's like. Yeah, that's great. What What is your information? So if people want to get a hold of you or they want to watch um, anything or see what you've got posted, how, how do you suggest they do that? Um. My website, michiganmysteries.com, that has information about missing ships, missing aircraft, and if you want to learn more about Robert Richard Lepsey, there's pictures of him and uh, his family on the website. There's also uh, photographs of him comparing him with the FBI composite sketches, and you can see for yourself if you think it looks like him or not. Uh, that's one way. Uh, my books are available on Amazon. The search for the Westmoreland is still missing. They're available on Amazon or through my website. And if you do searches on YouTube, you might be able to find some of my dive videos under NMI Rex is my name on YouTube. N, N for Northern and MI for Michigan and then Rex for Shipwrecks. And, or type in Shipwreck Westmoreland and that will give you a lot of information too. It's fantastic. And we'll link it to our website as well. Well, it's been a really, really interesting hour. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.